Hello, I'm Paddy Delaney, and welcome to Integrated Infrastructure, a podcast dedicated to bringing you news and views from industry leaders involved in the development, design, construction, and management of the many built forms that make up Australia's integrated infrastructure. This is episode six of Integrated Infrastructure. This week, I had the opportunity to catch up with Paul Ferris. Paul is the general manager of M&E and Rail at Lendlease Engineering. Paul tells us how his career pivoted from the dying UK coal mining industry and into rail before he eventually came out to Australia. Amongst other things, we talk about the tidal wave of projects on the way, why talent is the biggest challenge in delivering that tidal wave, and we talk about the need to attract, retain and train people to the industry. We also talk about why there needs to be a major mindset change when it comes to viewing transferable skills from other industries. Paul sees some real challenges for the industry, but none that are insurmountable, and all the leaders on a path to a very exciting future. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Remember to su- subscribe, like, and share if you do. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Paul. But Paul, welcome to Integrated Infrastructure. Thanks ever so much for coming on and having a chat to us today. Um, let's get straight into it, um, and um, maybe you could introduce yourself, tell people who you are, and um, and, and what you do. Thanks very much. It's um, it's a pleasure to be talking to you this morning. Um, my name is Paul Ferris. I'm the general manager for Rail and M and E with Lend Lease. Um, a bit about myself: I've been in Australia um, almost 14 years now. Um, proud to say I spent the first year or so up in Mackay doing a, um, an electrification scheme into the port of Darrenpool Bay. So that was very interesting and a great insight into Australia, having landed in a, a regional area first rather than one of the major cities. And then some time in Brisbane and the rest of my time in Sydney, um, albeit in a national role. So I've had uh, some fantastic opportunities all around Australia, uh, like I say, for the past 14 years. Prior to that, I worked on a number of um, large alliances and um, contracts in the UK, in London and in Manchester. And prior to that, I was in the mining industry, looking at um, heavy belt um, and scraper conveyors for the coal and um, quarrying industries. So um, very short snapshot about myself there. No, that was great. I, I actually, um, I didn't realise that. I just obviously did a bit, bit of research for our conversations today, but I didn't realise that you a, were, had a mechanical background rather than a rail yes. background, yes. Um, and um, and B, that you'd been in mining before anything else. So, Yeah, I think um, you talk about backgrounds, and, and even now with um, in your subject area with recruitment, you look at people's qualifications and what they've done, and there still really isn't any true rail qualifications to be gained, and people yeah. move into it after either electrical you know, a civil or mechanical background. So it is quite interesting where people in the rail industry come from and they all come together. Yeah, no, fantastic. Look, um, um, I think I've explained the sort of the premise of, uh, of the podcast is really to try and give something back to, um, um, to to people that we work with and the candidates and the clients that we work with. And um, um, we were literally just talking about uh, about COVID and about the current situation. And uh, one of the things that we try and do on the podcast is to um, give people some relatable stories about when um, um, you know, we have um, been in a, in a similar situation, maybe where the economy has been tough or there's been some difficult times and um, and, and being able to see a route out of that. Um, I'm sure you've seen a couple of recessions um, um, like I have in, in the UK um, and you've seen probably seen the GFC over here as well. Are, are, are there any times that you sort of um, can, can uh, reference back to where, uh, you know, it's um, it's been similar to, to, to what it is now? Uh, I think there's one, I mean, I touched briefly there on you know, my first um, career, if you like, in the mining industry and the, and the quarrying um, after the, you know, the miners strike and um, everything. Of and course. And coal having a downturn in the UK. Um, I told a story at a few conferences and, and, um, and the like that my first job out on site was to install a conveyor belt that took coal off ships from Australia at Port, <laughs> Port Talbot in Wales. My first job in Australia was to to build a railway to put coal onto ships. That's to sound back the other way. <laughs> so a bit of a full circle. But yeah, definitely. Um, so like I say, I was in the mining industry. That took a downturn. Um, and at the same time, that must have been around the, the late 90s. Um, mm. So all the support services of which we, we were one um, were, were all in downturn. Lots of redundancies. Industry is really disappearing, to, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and at the, the very same time, the rail industry um, 
uh, network rail had just come into fruition. And so the number of alliances were just starting up. And so a lot of people transitioned from that mining sector into um, the rail industry. So that, that's, that's a good example. Yeah. Uh, and that was a crazy time, wasn't it? End of the 90s when, um, um, you know, we had that, that, that big recession. I started working in 99, came out of university then, and there were very little options, which is why I ended up in recruitment, funnily enough, <laughs> <laughs> having done politics and economics. Um, but um, that, that was a stressful time. And um, how, how did you find those opportunities to be able to transition? Was that, was that the, the sort of natural course of the industry or were, were, were the people that supported you to be, to be able to go and do that? Um, I had a, a mentor at the time that was in the rail industry. Um, mm. He pointed me in the right directions when it came to um, how to position yourselves, you know, even things like writing your CV, uh, making sure that you understood what experience you had yourself. So I think sometimes um, everything has to come together. That's, that involves a positive mindset, understanding mm. what skills you've got and understanding how transferable they are. Yeah. Because I think sometimes you can be your own worst enemy and believe that you haven't got a skill set that will suit an industry when in fact you have and the people that are looking for for talent um, might be looking for something that you, you don't know you actually possess yourself. So it's that self-awareness and that positive mindset to put yourself forward and mm. uh, put yourself forward for those positions. So I think at that time I was fortunate enough to um, you know, have somebody who guided me in the right direction. At the same time, um, like I say, the rail industry was was growing and so there were a number of opportunities for skills to be transferred and, and that's what mm. happened. And were you, um, um, did you ever sort of think you'd end up in rail or did you have an interest in rail or um, was it more the mechanical side of things that you're interested in? Um, I think I always had an interest in construction, you know, particularly mm. site works, you know, the logistics and uh, the people management side of construction. So that was always an interest and always something that um, I was able to do and, that, well, you know, you don't like talking about yourself, but a bit of a talent for. So I, I always enjoyed it. Mm. I think enjoying your work, you know, it makes you better at your your own particular tasks as well. Yeah. You can enjoy work. That's an absolute bonus. Um, so, yeah. So when I did transfer in, um, I was able to find a position where I could put those skills um, to the task. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I was talking to the, the podcast that we released this week was with a, a good friend of mine called Ken Hawkins, um, who, who went from um, left school, school in, at year 10 and then went to um, sort of do, do laboring on a Mervac site and ended up sort of through, through his hard work sort of um, coming up through the HSC route in, uh, in construction. And then took a massive career pivot and went down the asset management side of things. And now he works in the, in the property world. You, you had a career pivot as well. Um, in this current market, there's got to be a lot of career pivots going on. You know, um, the number of people from Qantas or uh, Virgin or, or, or other industries that um, the travel dependent. Um, what advice would you give um, to people who are, who are you know, looking for a career pivot at the moment, maybe looking to get into, um, into engineering or into rail specifically? Uh, in terms of advice, I think I've touched on it already in terms of that self-awareness, knowing what skills you've got and understanding mm. that they are transferable. Um, you look at some of the people like you've already mentioned who work for Qantas in that airline industry, you know, lots of great talent in there. Um, and I do remember um, with, with the mining sector, British Rail actively, you know, went to, um, I know the management unions um, and, and other bodies that knew where the talent was and, and what they were doing. Um, to introduce what kind of a role was there um, for people. So in, in terms of um, advice for moving into um, you know, transferable sectors or career pivots, uh, it is that self-awareness, knowing what skills you've got, um, understanding that um, you are valuable to the industry. And infrastructure isn't just about engineering. There's so many tasks that have to be undertaken. You know, there's logistics, there's planning, um, finance, commercial, um, it's not just the, the people who can actually um, you know, do the calculations on the structure, for example. There's a whole support network required. So there's, there's many, many um, skills and opportunities in the industry as a whole. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. With all of this, everybody's talking about needing to, to, to repurpose people, retrain them, get them into jobs. From a, um, a recruiter's point of view, um, clients never want somebody who hasn't done exactly what the job is. You know, they, 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 they sort of say, well, no, they haven't done this. They haven't done that. They haven't done the other. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to take a mindset shift, isn't it? And, and a culture shift from, um, um, from people, especially with this infrastructure pipeline that we've got coming, you know, um, and, and the, and the inability to bring people in from overseas. Um, 
how, how's, that, how's that mindset going to happen? Because I think that some people will make it easily or certainly be active in doing that. And it'll be hard work to do it because you're going to have to dig down into people's skills more and understand what they can do, like you, exactly as you said. Um, but I, I wonder if industry might struggle with that a little bit. You know, it's easy to say, but much harder to do. Definitely. And that's, that's really interesting. It's a good question because not only can we not bring people in from overseas, you know, short term, we might not be able to bring people in from interstate. Yeah. We've already seen issues with COVID, people flying in, um, New South Wales, Queensland, and especially Victoria at the moment. Yeah. So we start seeing these, these waves start to flatten out, um, to use an expression that's used quite a lot um, in recent times. Um, we are going to have an issue. And I think um, there is um, an onus on hiring managers to understand um, that they can't always have exactly what they want because the people aren't there in the industry. The level of experience yeah. isn't there. Um, and, and we shouldn't forget the backdrop of all this is we've got more infrastructure work in Australia than Australia's ever seen. Uh, we all talk about this tidal wave of projects that um, is now here. You know, it's not just on the horizon. Um, look at New South Wales, Victoria, Perth, Queensland, all have got major projects um, actually happening on the ground and more in the pipeline. So mm. you've almost got a perfect storm when it comes to recruitment and um, identifying talent. So I think there has to be an open mind on, um, on recruitment when people are looking at CVs. You know, if they don't see what they want in the first page and a half, you know, not to discard and really ask the proper questions in an interview as to where people can be purposed. Yeah, that's a, that segues quite nicely to another thing that we, we've talked about recently in terms of um, to let's let's say we get to the point where we're going to repurpose these people. We're going to bring them in and invest in them. Um, so that they can they can be part of this infrastructure boom and the the, the operative word in, in what I just said is the invest bit and to invest in people you need money and to have money you need to be making money and the industry's got a problem with that at the moment haven't they um, yeah. yeah so um, what are you seeing right now to, to um, that's going to improve the situation in terms of this profit of pro profitless boom in the work coming through the pipeline? Are you seeing stuff that, that you, you're sort of feeling positive about? I think uh, there is positivity out there. Um, we always talk about equitable risk sharing. I mm. think we've still got some way to go to understand what that actually means. Um, if you've got um, a special purpose vehicle, you know, such as an alliance or a PPV, PPP, um, they have to be able to manage those risks and at the start of the process in procurement, actually understand them as well. So I think um, from the client side, again, as I said, we've got some huge projects um, coming out to the market in, in all states. I do believe um, we are still getting there when it comes to understanding who is best placed to manage that risk. And I think we will get there. It has been a long process. Um, and we've talked about you know, the people in the industry who are available uh, we've got huge client organizations now where, where people have joined. Sometimes there's a mix of contractors and, um, and salaried staff. So again, that adds some complexity into the mix. Um, but I do believe as an industry, you know, we are getting there and we will finally get to a point where we do have an equitable risk shared. And yeah. therefore it should lead to you know, good project um, delivery and then hopefully um, margins at the end of the, the project completion. Yeah, um, uh, Victoria's done quite well on the on the alliancing um, sort of model model in the in the recent years with the um, uh, the um, uh, the level crossing removals. Level crossing removals, yes. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, New South Wales, we're seeing a a form of contract coming along, sort of similar to Central Station, where there's a a, a more collabor collaborative risk sharing, not necessarily equitable, but collaborative risk sharing. Um, is it, is it time we saw some more alliancing come come out of New South Wales? Do you think, especially for the, those sort of you know up to a billion dollar sort of type 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 projects? Mm -hmm. um, there has been a couple of alliances quite recently with more trains, more services, um, mm. more rail alliance. You know that's been going for a, for a long time now. Albeit, yeah. I think New South Wales turned to um, you know competitive alliances um, for a while. Uh, so I, I do believe alliances are still still used. Um, albeit in, in the form of a collaborative contract without using the, the alliance word. So it's that kind of model, that collaborative model, where you can share that risk and understand it together. That is best um, to move forward with. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, no, great stuff. Um, 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 besides what we've sort of touched on already, what, what do you think the biggest challenges are for the industry right now, for in infrastructure as a whole? 
I think it's something that's often said um, too much, you know, that people are the most important, important asset. I know we've already touched on it. However, mm. that is the biggest risk that we're facing going forward. Mm. The amount of work in the market, the amount of complex work in the market, um, the lack of mobility um, in Australia, the lack of the ability to bring people in from overseas and having to really make sure we get the best out of who we have in industry at the moment. Um, I've already said client side now have you know large teams of very, very competent people, very experienced people. Mm. Um, that has somewhat diminished the contractor pool from which you can hire from and which people move around in. So are people best placed in the industry as a whole to deliver the work that's in the pipeline? You know, that's yeah. a that I think we all have to, um, have to have a look at. Yeah, definitely. Pe- pe- people and uh, capability is definitely the biggest, uh, one of the biggest issues for sure. Um, what can you tell us about the Lendlease, Coleman, Asiona um, um, situation? Still going through a change of control. Uh, there's been a number of um, announcements made to the market uh, that we're still going through that process. I think from a personal note, all I can say is a very exciting opportunity. Um, mm. you know, it's not just the Asiona um, and Lendlease Engineering coming together, but we've got Coleman Rail and, and uh, John Beaver M&E capability as well. So yeah, I think um, we get the, the structure right, um, the people coming together. So, you know, some great teams um, in terms of rail for the people mm. that are in Lendlease Engineering and also in Coleman Rail. So when the two come together, and, and like I say, we do get that um that mix correct of um, Common Rail and Asiona, I think it's a very exciting time. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, brilliant. And um, any idea what the timeline is for sort of uh, un- understanding a bit more about what that's going to look like? Or is that um, a-, a few weeks off, a few months off? I can't say. Uh, we're going through the change of control, as you can appreciate. It's a very complex yeah. process. Um, so there's been some communication out to the market. So hopefully um, we can get that all completed. Yeah, very good. And you've been you've been at home for months now, haven't you? You've you've been sort of, you know you've been in the office for quite a while. Fair while, yes. Um, working from home, I think from the end of March. Um, yeah. was the start of it. So um, that brings its own challenges. Um, I think things such as Zoom, which we're on now, and, and Teams has worked very very well. It has needed a change of focus as to how we all work. Yeah. Now out on projects, you know, people are still out in the field delivering. So it's been different for a lot of people in the industry, but um, yeah, it's been at home for a while now. Yeah, fantastic. Look, um, we are a short form podcast and uh, very much appreciate your time. And I know you're a very busy man. So to, to finish off, um, tell us what you're excited about right now. Uh, we'll just touch on it. Very excited about the, um, the Asiona, Lendlease, Coleman Rail um, deal being completed. Mm. I think it's an exciting future, lots of work in the market. Um, Talks about people. I think um, you know, making sure we've got the people in the right positions, um, making sure you know we've got that um, set up correct, um, and looking at the pipeline ahead. So it is a very exciting time. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I, I've been on um, a few calls recently and listening to the um, one in particular this week, a new New South Wales um, infrastructure update, and um, the amount of work that's coming is just bonkers. It's absolutely crazy, yeah. 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 And, 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 and you know, their their, their biggest concern is, um, is 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 the flow of work and giving that flow of work to the market. Um, so, um, I think it's going to be great once um, you know the your your um, company sort of is 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 fully formed and ready to go because um, having a, another really sort of big formidable uh, top tier contractor is is really important for the market to be able to actually deliver all of that work as well. Um, so. Fantastic. Look, Paul, thanks ever so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and um, again, I'll compliment you on your bookcase behind you. It's very uh, Zoom friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have a fantastic weekend. You too. Thanks very much. Cheers, Paul. Thanks. Bye. Integrated Infrastructure is powered by North Search, specialists in executive and technical search across engineering, design, construction, property, and energy markets in Australia. If you'd like to find out more about North Search or get involved with this podcast, you can click on the links in the show notes or email me directly at the address on the screen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Integrated Infrastructure. Please tell your friends and colleagues if you did, and we hope to see you again soon.